So today we start uh, John Dunn. We won't finish Dunn. I think I've got two days. No, it looks like three or four days. Um, assigned for Dunn. A couple of things about him. Um, notice, you've got an interesting statement at the bottom of the first page of the introduction. And the reason I say it's an interesting statement is because it's very misleading. Uh, my dissertation was on Dunn, so I, I do know a little bit about it. Um, uh, da, 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 where is it? Dunn's mother, Elizabeth. Third sentence, third line in that bottom paragraph. Uh, Dunn's mother, Elizabeth, was related to Thomas More and was beheaded as a traitor for refusing to support Henry VIII's rejection of the Pope's authority. No. It should say, Dunn's mother, Elizabeth, was related to Thomas More, who was beheaded as a traitor for refusing to support Henry VIII's rejection. Dunn's mother wasn't beheaded. It was Thomas More who was beheaded by Henry VIII. Pretty major difference or distinction. Because if Dunn's mother had been beheaded, John Dunn never would have been born. Uh, because Henry VIII died in 1546. Uh, pretty sure that was before his mother was born. Um, so his mother was related to Thomas More. His wife was related to Thomas More. Okay, Thomas More was a Catholic. Um, he he got on the bad side of Henry VIII, not only because he wouldn't go along with one of Henry's divorces. I don't remember if that one mentions. Doesn't. But it's referring back to the. No, to the act of succession and the act of supremacy. Okay. A couple other things about that. So, so Dunn's family comes from a line of Catholics. One other thing mentioned at the end of that paragraph. Two of Dunn's mother's uncles. Okay. Lived in exile. No, I don't, I don't think that's right either. It's two of Dunn's uncles lived in exile. And another was incarcerated. Dunn's brother Henry died of a fever while in prison for harboring a priest. So Dunn's family was Catholic. <coughs> old, old, <coughs> excuse me, old school Catholic, old style Catholic. Um, we, I don't want to put this, it's believed that Dunn probably attended, I think it was Oxford, okay, Hart College, I think it was, but he never graduated. We know he never graduated because he's not listed on um, any list of graduates, and the reason I say we believe is because he's not actually listed on any of the roles of students okay, at this college. But it's thought that he, I think there's anecdotal evidence. I'd have to look at some of the biographies. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked at any of those. One of the reasons <coughs> he wouldn't have graduated was because after Henry VIII's act of succession and act of supremacy, in order to graduate from one of the, the universities like Oxford or Cambridge, you had to agree to the oath of supremacy that the king is the head of the English church. Catholics couldn't do that in good conscience. For, for Catholics, the only head of the church is the Pope. All right? um, it's not that rather you know, the reason why Dunn did not attend or graduate at least. 
Uh, now, obviously, that could also be fudged. Because we know, for example, um, Christopher Marlowe, who was a contemporary Shakespeare and Dunn, died in the early 1590s, late 1380s. It's in here. Uh, killed in a apparently a barroom, well, according to the Dominic story, barroom brawl in a pub in Deptford, uh, according to the Conspiracy theory, he was assassinated because of what he knew. Okay? We know Christopher Marlowe had worked as a spy for Queen Elizabeth. He was given an honorary master's degree from Cambridge University. Okay? He should not have received that degree for minimum two reasons. One, he was an avowed atheist. And two, he was an open homosexual. Both of which capital crimes in Elizabethan England, okay? But he got, you know, this award, uh, master's degree, honor. Back to Dunn. So, Dunn's family was Catholic. Sometime, we don't know exactly when, in the late 1590s, early 1600s, 1600 to 1610, Dunn starts to have some kind of um, trying to think of the verb I want. Religious, not conversion, religious, um, not difficulty. What's the phrase? Qualms, I guess. He, he starts to doubt whether or not Catholicism is the true faith. And I don't have it assigned simply because we were out of time. We're always out of time when I reach this point this semester. Look at Satire 3 that's in your book. Satire 3 is all about what is true religion. Okay? And there's a line in there, you know, is it in Geneva? That is, the Reformed Church. Is it in Rome, Catholic Church? Or is it in London, the Anglican Church? Okay? And what the speaker says is, you don't really know. What you have to do is keep searching. As long as you're searching for the true church, that's the important thing, okay? So Dunn has this, you know, problem, let's say. What we do know is by the end of the 1600s, 1609 or so, he's kind of moved from Catholic beliefs of, let's say, the early 1590s to the Anglican Church. Okay? Your introduction talks about this. And we pretty much know that because of two works that he wrote. One called Ignatius, his conclave, and that's talking about St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuits. Bear in mind, he had an uncle who was a Jesuit and died in prison. Okay? Um, and Ignatius's conclave, conclave, like a meeting of bishops or a meeting of prelates, church people, it's in one of the lower circles of hell. So Dunn puts, you know, people from his faith tradition down there in lower hell. That's, it's not unique to Dunn. Dante did the exact same thing. Read the Divine Comedy and see how many people Dante meets going through hell who are archbishops, cardinals, and popes. In fact, at the very lowest circle of hell, he's got popes who were alive in his day. Okay. Um, so he writes Ignatius's Conclave and what's the other one? Pseudomartyr, yeah. Uh, which argues that Catholics should take the oath of allegiance to the crown and then, you know, Ignatius's Conclave describes the meeting of Jesuits in hell. Okay. 16, what happened in 1603? Not to done to everybody in England. King James becomes king. All right? I'm going to talk about Dunn's marriage in just a moment, but I want to do this first. 1603, James becomes king of England. James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England. James, I've mentioned before, fancies himself a scholar. He actually wrote a book called Demonology. 
Okay. Shakespeare, according to tradition, Shakespeare wrote Macbeth as a way of flattering James because it's got demons and witches and it's set in Scotland. And, you know. um, according to tradition, early, the earliest biographies and such of, of Dunn, James took a shining to Dunn. And he wanted Dunn to become a priest, Anglican priest, and he essentially wanted him to become his kind of like private chaplain. Okay? Now, if the king wants you to do something and the king is not overt about that, what can the king do? Just what I did. He shuts all the doors that are open boxes you in, okay? So that Dunn was not able to find real good gainful employment. Now, he did find an employer, a guy named Robert Drury, Sir Robert Drury, and Dunn worked as secretary to him. Secretary not at all like, you know, a modern clerical secretary, but secretary like an administrative assistant to a cabinet secretary. The person who handles all the correspondence, right? Position of secretary was one for a highly educated individual. Dunn does eventually take what are called holy orders. In 1650, he becomes an Anglican priest. Okay? So let me back up for a moment. Two, go back to for a second. Uh, page 914. Okay. 914, the, the first full paragraph, mentions in 1598, Dunn becomes secretary to Sir Thomas Edgerton, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal. The Great Seal is the seal that the monarch uses to authenticate official documents. So, you know, the keeper to the great seal is a person who keep, carries this thing around in a box wherever the queen or king goes so that when the king has a, or queen, has an official charter document proclamation to sign, the seal is brought out, the wax is put on the paper, the seal is put, and that's it. Very, very, very important position, okay, that Edgerton held. Dunn was secretary to this guy. Very high-ranking person, therefore, in government. Okay? So, this is in 1598. 1572 to 1598, Dunn was 26. Right? Right? 72, 98, yeah, 26. We're told, in 1601, however, he nearly wrecked his prospects by a secret marriage to Edgerton's 17-year-old niece. So, in 1598, Dunn is 26. In 1601, he marries, okay, so now he's 29, he marries Edgerton's 17-year-old niece, she's 12 years younger, right? Anne Moore, that's her last name, Anne Moore lived with at her uncle's house. So Dunn probably met her in 1598, when she would have been 14, right? Here's the interesting thing. We have an awful lot of poems, songs and songs, that are addressed by a speaker to his lover that talk an awful lot about, we got to keep our, our relationship secret. Because, you know, if so-and-so finds out, we're going to be in deep. 26-year-old and a 14-year-old, what would we call that today? Pedophilia, depending on what happened, maybe statutory rape, you know, not saying anything did happen. I'm just, you know, times were different. Times were different. They married in 1601, 
And in she dies in 1617, I believe. I don't think your book mentions when she actually dies. I'm pretty sure she dies in 1617. So she dies 16 years later, yeah, at the age of 33, after having 12 children, five of whom we're still born, I believe. 17 new years of marriage, 16 years of marriage, 12 children. That's an awful long time to be almost perpetually pregnant. Oh, I've had five pregnancies. We have four children, you know, over nine years. So when this happens, when he gets married in 1601, your, your introduction mentioned this, when it's discovered, because they marry secretly, when it's discovered, the you know what hits the fan. Okay? Her father, uh, excuse me, her uncle, obviously, is very upset. Dunn gets fired. So he loses his job. He's now married. Her father, Sir George Moore, Okay, so he's kind of important. He has Dunn thrown in jail for a period of three to four months. Dunn tries to, you know, soften him up, tries to wear him down a bit. And interestingly, Dunn's letters to his father-in-law are all at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. There's about 20 of them in Dunn's own handwriting. You know, and they kind of, sorry, sorry, sorry. But eventually, it gets to, you know, a sharing of ideas and stuff, and Dunn gets released. But now, 1602 and stuff, he's got a growing family. And he's essentially unemployed until he becomes secretary to Thomas Drury. Then, 1615, he takes holy orders, becomes Anglican priest, Anglican priest to Mary, becomes Anglican priest. Two years later, she dies. So now he's a widower, right? He still has some kids, still alive. One of the poems, that my dissertation was uh, an edition of Dunn's Holy Sonnets, which became the kind of the rough basis for the very warm edition of the poetry, John Dunn's volume on the Holy Sonnets. He writes a sonnet that's probably about his wife's death. Because it talks about, since she whom I love hath paid her last debt. Maybe talk about that when we do the sonnets. Assuming we do the sonnets. Then 1621 or so, yeah, 1621, Dunn is appointed Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. This is not the St. Paul's Cathedral that you would see if you go to London today. Big, massive stone edifice. This was the St. Paul's London uh, St. Paul's Cathedral that burned down in the Great Fire of 1666. Okay? Massive timber framed building. But Dunn became Dean of St. Paul's. That is, he was the highest ranking church person there. He kind of ran the whole show. All right? From the early 1590s, let's just say 1590, do it that way, to roughly 1615. Dunn wrote all kinds of verse. He wrote religious verse and he wrote secular verse, right? Most of it was secular or profane. Most of it was love poetry. Some of it very, very risque love poetry. I mean, most people would look at it and go, that's just not that dirty. And we, we, I don't think we're doing any of those. We can be. Um, but when he took holy orders in 1615, he wrote a letter to a friend, a guy named Sir Henry Goodyear, and he asked him for that little book that he had given him. Us Dunn scholars think that's referring to a book of Dunn's poetry that Dunn had written by hand that he'd loaned to Sir Henry Goodyear. And in the letter, Dunn is saying, you know, because of my change, he's taking holy orders, He's got to write a, he's got to produce a valedictory to his former life. 
a saying goodbye. So it, the implication is he's going to publish that love poetry and stuff as his saying goodbye to the old life. All right? And from that point on, he's only going to write religious poetry. All right? If you were rummaging around in a library somewhere or an old manor house and you found this book, and you can prove it's Dunn's handwriting, it's one of those things where you could probably name your chair of English literature anywhere. Because it's one of these things that if we had, we could compare that book of all of Dunn's poems that exist to that point and, and be able to see, okay, what did Dunn really mean? A little interesting tidbit. Like I said, I used to, I was an editor for the, assistant editor for the Dunbury Orm. We have more copies of poems by Dunn from the 17th century than we do any other poet. Handwritten copies, not published, handwritten. More than 5,000 copies of his slightly more than 200 poems. One of his poems, I think it's in here, called The Anagram, there's like 95 handwritten copies. So somebody would read it, you're looking at this, and you go, oh man, this is great, and you copy it down. And you give the copy to a friend, and they copy it down. Right? Shakespeare, we have nothing like that. John Milton, we have nothing like that. None of the other poets do we have anywhere near the number of copies that we do of Dunn's poems. Right? Dunn didn't publish hardly anything in his own lifetime. Most of his poems were distributed in, in that form handwritten copy. It's called manuscript publication. He would circulate them to a circle of friends. Circle of friends would copy them. They'd circulate them to their circles of friends, and they go out that way. Okay? When I was working on my PhD, I would say that a, uh, my major professor was the general editor of the Dunbury Orb. And one of my tasks, one of my jobs, was I'd pull out microfilms. And I'd go through microfilms and scroll through and try to find copies. Done poems that weren't in lists of books. I found two. One of them was one of the poems we're going to be doing with a couple of lines missing. And the lines that were missing that were, were lines that talking about don't let your father know. Kind of, you know, interesting lines to be missing. Um, 1623, so it becomes Dean of St. Paul's in 21. 1623, Dunn gets sick. Really, he thinks he's died. And he writes a series of poems and meditation called Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Emergent, like emergency. He thinks he's dying. So he's writing this, these poems and these little meditations kind of on death. We're going to read one of them, Meditation 17, that Ernest Hemingway steals the title of a book from, For Whom the Bells Toll or for, according to the title, from the bell tolls, okay? Um, and so do Simon and Garfunkel. Their song, The Boxer, that has the line, you know, no, uh, I am a rock, I am an island. It's no man is an island. It's an, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay, so let's start with from the songs and sonnets. And then Dunn dies in 1633, uh, 1631. About a month before he dies, he knows he's dying. Little tidbit. He dresses in his burial shroud. I mean, he takes all of his clothes off, puts a burial shroud put over him, lies down flat, so a guy can do a sketch and prepare a, an effigy, a funerary statue. You can go to St. Paul's Cathedral today. It's, it's one of the few things that survived from the fire of London. Okay? And you can see that and how it drapes over his body and his face is all frail and all that kind of stuff because he was dying of probably something like tuberculosis. Okay? So, songs and sonnets. The Good Morrow. One thing about the songs and sonnets, we don't know that some of these titles are done. We have one poem written in Dunn's handwriting. It's what's called a verse letter. In fact, it's the verse letter, 
It's in your book on page. Page 928. It's a letter written as a poem. And the way Dunn did this, because I've looked at this thing, sheet of paper written and then just folded and on the outside to Sir Henry Watton and just sealed with the white seal. So it's just a single sheet of paper folded and delivered like that. Okay? So page 915, The Good Morrow. Now, they're called songs and sonnets, but none of these are actual sonnets. None of these love poems. The holy sonnets are sonnets. They're true sonnet form. But none of these little love poems are actually like the, the structure of, for example, Shakespeare's sonnets. I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Were we not weaned till then? but sucked on country pleasures childishly? Or snorted we in the seven sleepers' den? T'was so. But this all pleasures fancies be, if ever any beauty I did see, which I desired and got, t'was but a dream of thee. I'm going to read all three stanzas and we'll talk about it. And now good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love, all love of other sights controls and makes one little room in everywhere. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone. Let maps to others, worlds on worlds have shone. Let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. And true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? Whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. Okay? One thing about Dunn said by Ben Johnson. Well, two things about Dunn. In a conversation with a Scottish poet, a guy named William Drummond, who lived in Hawthornden, Johnson said, Dunn, for not keeping of accent, deserved hanging. Not keeping of accent means for not writing in iambic pentameter. Da 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 da. Like Shakespeare wrote. All of, you can read Shakespeare's sonnet. If you get iambic pentameter in your mind, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. Unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, ten syllables like that. Dunn doesn't do that. Dunn likes to take accent, meter, and switch it all up. Why? Because he's tired of the old, stale meter that everybody's using. He wants to make people work. The other thing Johnson said was... That Dunn would not be read outside his century. That Dunn's work would essentially die with his own, with, with himself. Interestingly, Dunn's reputation survived much better than Ben Johnson's did. If you get it, you know, get in something like PMLA today and, or dissertation index, and you search for dissertations as an example, you'll find a lot more people writing dissertations on John Dunn than you will on Ben Johnson. And that's simply because of the different breadth of kind of writing that Dunn did. Now, one thing about Dunn that, you know, Johnson doesn't address this, but it's, he's kind of right. In the 18th century, that is the century following Dunn's, Dunn wasn't known primarily as a poet. He was known as a preacher. See, once he became, 1615, once he became dean of... Um, a preacher, and then later once he became dean of St. Paul's, it was his duty to deliver sermons at St. Paul's. Dunn's sermons 
were so well attended that there was standing room only. And people would stand on the porch outside St. Paul's to listen through the doors. And here's the kicker. His sermons could last up to three hours long. There aren't, I don't think there's any of the sermons in your, in your book. He, well over 100 sermons of his survive. I think it's like 150, 200. His sermons are so tightly constructed. It's like building a house. And in one of them, he talks about a sermon is like a house. You lay a foundation, you build the walls, superstructure, the roof, flooring, okay? And it goes on and on like that. But that's what he was known as throughout the 18th and 19th century as a sermon writer. Early 20th century, because of people like T.S. Eliot, rediscovered Dunn, and he takes off. So, back to this poem. The Good Morrow. The Good Morning. Now, what does that mean? It's not like, hey, good morning. It's the new morning. All right? I wonder by my troth, by my faith, what, and just notice the accent in this, you know, these two lines. What thou, and I did, the run online, and then it ends abruptly, till we loved. What did you and I do until we loved? That is, until we loved each other. Were we not weaned till then? but sucked on country pleasures, right? Don't mean to offend anybody, but you need to know. Well, you don't need to know this, but I actually think you do. In Dunn's day, initial S's at the beginning of words use the long S form. Look at, for example, the Declaration of Independence. Does the same thing. About 100, no, take that back. Yeah, it's like 150 years later or so, right? So, the only difference between this and an F are a little line like that. See, the F isn't this big line. And often, what poets will do, and Dunn is one of them, Shakespeare does it too, is they will pun on orthography how something is spelled or how it looks like it is spelled. So that we suck, you know, on country pleasures. Now I've looked at hundreds of manuscript copies of Dunn's poems. And that word, country, is more often than not, probably, based upon my experience, spelled that way. C-U-N-T-R-Y. Right? Hamlet will say, in response to Ophelia, Ophelia says something about, you know, you're being fresh or something, in the play within the play scene. And Hamlet makes a joke and he says, oh, you thought I meant country matters when he talked about putting his head in her lap? Remember, Shakespeare loves a pun. If, if he could really Reach for a pun, he'll reach for it. If the pun is just put right in front of him, he'll jump into it. Okay? So suck country pleasures. Notice how easily that could be misread. To what country pleasures? Dunn is going to, Dunn's like Shakespeare. If he can have a double entendre, or if he can make somebody think it says something it doesn't say, he will. Okay? But sucked on country pleasures childishly. What's the childishly imply? Innocently. Innocently. There's nothing, nothing nefarious, nothing sinful here. Okay? Or snorted we in the seven sleepers den. And you got a footnote down at the bottom. The seven sleepers of Ephesus. This is a, a um, early church tradition, early church story about these sleepers, these people who ran away from persecution, they hid in a cave, 
and they slept, I think it is, for about 230 years. Okay, and then woke up, persecutions were gone, and lived on until they died. Twas so. In other words, until we loved each other, everything was like what? It was like a dream. It was like it hadn't happened yet. Okay? Twas so. But this, except for this, this what? This, our love. All pleasures, fancies, be. All pleasures are, except for our love, all pleasures are fantasies. They're not real. If, and then the speaker gets a little more direct. If ever any beauty I did see, notice I, not we, I did see, which I desired and got, and there, you know, we could go back and talk about some of Shakespeare's sonnets. What? Twas but a dream of youth. This is, again, this is notice. When is the speaker talking in these last two lines? If ever any beauty I did in the past, when? Before you and I, before you and I were we. If there is ever any beauty I desired and got, you know, lust and action kind of a thing, it was what? It was a dream, an image, a fantasy of you. Of all the lovers I've known before, they're foreshadowings of you, the speaker is saying. And now, so all that's in the past. This is the good tomorrow. Why? Because our souls are waking up. My soul, what? Sees your soul. Your soul sees my soul. And now good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear. That is, my soul isn't looking at you and your soul isn't looking at me because of fear that I'm going to turn and go away. You know, love is not alters when it alteration finds. Why? For love, all love of other sights controls it doesn't mean I'm going to be the controlling figure. I'm going to lock you up in the house. It means your love for me controls your psyching others. I don't look at you because I'm afraid that you're going to look away. I look at you because my love tells me not to look here and not to look here. You are all I want to see and makes one little room and everywhere. What's the one little room? It's a bedroom. And if this one little room, think of the microcosm of the macrocosm, if this one little room is in everywhere, let's assume this is a bed, then this outer bed is a microcosm of all other beds. So, I don't need to get into this bed, or this bed, or this bed. Why? Because when I'm with you, the speaker is essentially saying, I'm with, you can either take it to mean the embodiment of all women, the ideal of all women, okay? This is the speaker essentially suggesting, if I sleep with you, I've slept with all you are the perfect woman, so to speak. Let's see, the, oh, new image. Let's see discoverers to new worlds have gone. You know, think Columbus. Let maps to others, you've got a gloss there, probably astronomical maps, to others, worlds on worlds have shown. See, I don't think that is referring to astron astronomical maps. I think that's referring to this world maps. Why? Because what does a map show? The world. 
You have the old world and it devastated. What was the Western Hemisphere still called the New World? Let us possess one world. Look at your gloss. Many manuscript versions have our world. And that could be a simple copying error because O-U-R and O-N-E do not look much different in 17th century handwriting. Let us possess one world, each hath one, and is one. Let us, us, possess one, and the two shall be one. Okay, I think this is talking about married love. I think an awful lot of Dunn's poems, his um, love poems, are talking about married love. Let us possess one world, each, I'm a world, your world, Notice, each hath one and is one. And I think that is one it's talking about together. Now notice the imagery. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. From a distance? No. When, if you look into somebody's face, when do you see your face in that other person's eyes? Get up real close. Notice what is happening, by the way. If you look in somebody else's face and you see your face, your image in their eyes, what have you kind of metaphorically just done? Reproduced yourself in that person. That is a form of reproduction. Not physical, but there's now two of you, right? There's this and there's the image there. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. In true, plain hearts. We had that kind of language in one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Do in the faces rest. True, plain hearts. They do what? They rest in the faces. They're at peace in the faces. Shakespeare had that one sonnet that talks about the furrows, the, the new looks, right? Where can we find two better hemispheres, right? Hemisphere, half of a sphere, half of a sphere, half of a sphere, without sharp north. Sharp probably meaning bitter, cold, without declining west. The British have a phrase. They still use it. So-and-so's gone west. Do you know what it means? Died. It's a very old phrase. That's why Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings, when people go west, they go to Valinor, they leave Earth. <laughs> It's the, the phrase we saw, or it's, it's related to the phrase we saw, for example, in um, Beowulf and, a couple, and I think the Wanderer. So-and-so's left the floor. It doesn't mean they've gone off the dance floor. It means they've left the world. Okay? Whatever dies was not mixed equally. Okay? Classical medical theory held that disease was the result of imp <clears throat> excuse me, improper balance among the body's elements. The body's elements. Earth, air, fire, water. Those are the four primary elements that everything is made of. Okay? Classical, not only medical theory, classical theory held that the reason things decay, this, this, this eventually, this in you know, however many billion years, Will decay, why? Because its elements are not mixed evenly. One will eventually kind of gain the upper hand and make the others disappear. So, whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, how can the two loves be one?
Well, if the two become one, that's one way. What else? If your love is like mine, and my love is like yours, meaning they're the same, then what? Or, or, okay, so, if our two loves aren't one, but, or, thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none, that neither. If we love each other so similar, similarly that neither of us go slack towards the other, what? None can die. What's the none? Our loves. What's the speaker saying? You know, I mentioned Shakespeare's Sonnet 116, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds Admit Impediments, was often used as, a, as part of a wedding ceremony in the 70s and stuff. Why not this poem? Because this poem is saying almost the same thing. If you love me like I love you, then what can never happen to our love? It'll never die. It, it's not even, you know, Shakespeare's out to the edge of doom. It's, it will never grow weaker. Okay, go from there to canonization. Right, canonization, is that the next one I have? Yes, canonization. We've got nine minutes, we could probably do that. I'll do this stanza by stanza. Okay, first of all, what does canonization refer to? Here's a perfect example of Dunn weaving profane poetry, that is poetry about earthly love, with sacred poetry, or sacred ideas, ideas about the divine, the holy. Canonization is the process by which Catholic Church makes someone or recognizes, let me put it that way, someone as a saint. Okay? For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Or chide my palsy or my gout, my five gray hairs or ruined fortune flout. With wealth your stake, your mind with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place, observe his honor or his grace, and the king's real or his stamped face, contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me move. Okay? For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Means what? Shut up and come here. Or shut up and let me go there. Let's stop talking. And everything else, okay? notice, or chide my palsy. So if you're not going to shut up, complain about, you know, my twitchiness or my gap, my swollenness in my leg, or comment about my five gray hairs, or comment about my bad fortune. Like after he got married and got found out and he lost his job. With wealth, your state, your mind with arts improve. Notice what he does. He puts the verb at the end. So, Improve your state, your position in the world with wealth, and with the arts, improve your mind. Take you a course that is a, could be a course of action, could be a course, a position someplace, get you a place, you've got a gloss there, course of action or a position, okay? Observe his honor like a judge or his grace like a religious figure. In the king's real, okay, kings imply this is written after 1603, King James. So observe the king's real face or his stamped face. Where would you see the king's stamped face? On coins. We don't have kings, but we do have a Lincoln, every penny. We've got George. Washington on the nickel. It's been so long since I've seen coins. On the We've got Roosevelt on the dime. Who's on the quarter? Uh, Washington. 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 Jefferson's on the nickel. Jefferson's on the nickel. Okay, see, it's been an awful long time. 
I don't see real money anymore. It's just all electronic. It goes where it's supposed to go. So observe the king's real or a stamped face. Contemplate. Do all of these things. What you will. What do you mean by will? Whatever you want. Approve. Do it. So whatever you do it. So you will let me love. As long as you allow me to love you. Alas, alas, who's injured by my love. It's almost like this is a dramatic monologue. Like the speaker is speaking to somebody and that other person says something. Whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Who's going to be injured if I love you? What merchant ships have my size drowned? That's a Petrarchan image. Okay, my size, my, uh, and the tears flowing, you know. How does that drown a merchant ship? That's an, an image straight out of Petrarch. Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my colds a forward spring remove? When did the heat which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? That is the death toll of the plague. Soldiers find wars. That is, soldiers look for wars. And lawyers find out still litigious men. Still there means constantly. What's he mean? Lawyers will always have lawyers. Why? Because there's always going to be one, somebody wanting to sue somebody else. Which quarrels move. That is, litigious men are moved by quarrels. Though, even though she and I do lose. That is, even though you and I still love, what? The world still goes about its business. You and I, the world's still going to keep on moving. Call us what? You will. Notice we've had a shift in address. This is no longer addressed to the lover. Why? Because the lover is now part of the us. Call us what you, you out there, you reader, you, you listener, what you will. We are made such by love. Whatever you call us, we're made that by our love for each other. Call her one, me another fly. Your gloss, a butterfly or moth. Because, you know, call her a fly, call me a fly. That's kind of weird. What's he mean? Well, he's using a conceit. A conceit is an image. <clears throat> Doug was famous for his metaphysical conceits. The term comes from John Dryden. About 60 years after probably eh, 70 years after Dunn writes this. Dryden came up with this phrase, metaphysical conceit, because he said, you know, sorry ladies, young women shouldn't read Dunn because he confuses their, 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 how did he put it? He uses a very particular phrase, which I seldom mention in class. He confuses young women's it's not frail, something like frail minds. He's, he's too hard for them. Because what does a metaphysical conceit do? It takes something over here, and it links it to something over here. And there's no apparent link between the two. But Dunn finds the thing that connects them. I used one day in class, sheesh, 25 years ago. I said to my students, I think this is a graduate course, I said, what links, and you have to know who these people are, by the way, what links Larry Flint with Pope John Paul II? Larry Flint was the publisher of Hustler magazine. He sued a variety of people for, you know, free speech things, right? Kind of a thoroughly despicable person. And they were like, a publisher of porn with the Pope. And one of the most highly respected popes in the last couple hundred years. What are you getting at? You know, and I had to draw the connection. 
Well, what's the connection John's going to draw? Call her one, me another fly, or moth. We're tapers too. What's a taper? It's a candle. Okay? So moths and candles, and at our own cost, die. So she's a taper. I'm a moth. She's a candle. It's dark. I'm a moth. What do I do? I fly to the right. I'm a candle. She's a moth. She flies towards me. And at our cost, our expense, we die. Well, there's a Renaissance commonplace idea there. I think I mentioned it before. Every time you have orgasmic sex, not just plain sex, every time you have sex and orgasm, a little part of you dies. Okay, it's Shakespeare's sonnet, you know, um, about the waste of shame, lust and action and such. So that you'll have poets who will talk about sex and talk about, you know, kill me, kill me more, kill me again. They're not talking about, you know, murderous actions. Um, okay, we'll have to stop there. We'll pick up with page 917 and... Finish that poem, and on Wednesday, yeah, we'll definitely get through the rest of this and the flea. Probably, we'll try to get the other two done, too, since we don't have all the batteries. If you haven't talked to me or sent me an email about your uh, paper topics, today is the last day to do that. Do a week from today. I'll send out a reminder with some additional information. Somebody sent me an email about format. Turn that off. Okay.